Good afternoon and welcome to Midday Life. I am Wendy Laya. Headlines for this afternoon. Five-member parliamentary ad hoc committee investigating the cash for seat saga begins work today. Presidency and Foreign Affairs Ministry contradicts each other over the continuous stay of the Gitmo II. Accra Metropolitan Assembly demolishes brothels close to the Kwame Nkrumah interchange here in Accra. In business this afternoon, Ghana Revenue Authority will from Friday, January 12, 2018, charge an African Union import levy of 0.2% on the cost issuance and freight of goods. We have details of these stories, including sports, entertainment, international news, all coming up in the next one hour. Do stay. Let's start with our very first story now. And the five-member parliamentary ad hoc committee investigating the cash for seats saga has begun sitting to investigate claims that the trade ministry extorted between $25,000 and $100,000 from expatriates to allow them to sit close to the president at the recently held Ghana Expatriates Business Awards. Minority Chief Whip Mohamed Mutaka has appeared before the committee and is giving evidence. Let's hear what he has been saying. With the Ministry of Trade and Industry, in the organization of the first <coughs> ever award, been targeted at reorganizing and rewarding the contribution of the expatriate and naturalized expatriate community. So it clearly says that this was started. This is the same, the Minister of Trade statement of 17 December, which we label document one saying that this novelty started through the government at the presidency. Now, you take the statement that was issued on 22nd by the same ministry, and paragraph 1 says, Neither His Excellency, the President, nor any official of the presidency, directly or indirectly, or even remotely, was connected with the said event. And that was recorded earlier. Let's head back to Parliament where my colleague Catherine Frimpoma will bring us the latest updates in relation to the sitting this afternoon. We did not have the power to issue a GCR to individuals who, whether it is sponsorship, call it whatever, what they did, they didn't have authority to do it. And I said that what they did was wrong and we needed to investigate to find out what truly happened because there are inconsistent statements coming from them. Honorable Minority Chief, do you think the Ghanaian taxpayer should have borne the cost of organizing the event? Mr. Chairman, why will the taxpayer borne the cost of such program that they claim was purely private? Why? They could have accepted to go and participate as invitees. And in that case, because we are public servants and they are private persons doing business in Ghana, the His Excellency, the security, the ministers, all driving to go there will be understandable. But for the ministry to organize this and spend, they needed to get approval from parliament and they needed to put it in their budget for us to approve so that they can account for it without necessarily taking money from anybody because the ministry does workshop they organize orientation and what have you through their agencies and it is always budgeted for parliament to approve so that when the year ends the auditor general gets opportunity to audit parliament gets opportunity to ask questions about the activities Honorable Muntaka, uh, could you demonstrate to this committee the provisions of any legislation or regulations that you think the Ministry of Trade breached? Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. First, I'll start with the LI, the Regulation 1802, Section 16. 17 and 18. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'll 
back to just quote. For the purposes of this regulation, non-tax revenue includes fine, penalties, forfeitures, fees, charges, rent on government lands and building, interest on government investment, dividend, and all other revenue generated from the activity, activities of the department. B, internal generated funds are non-tax revenue that are generated through the activities of the department. 17, that's collection and lodgement of non-tax revenue. 17, a head of a department shall A, ensure that all non-tax revenue are efficiently collected. B, ensure that all non-tax revenue is immediately lodged in the designated consolidated fund transit account, a bank account, except in the case of internal generated funds retained under an, an, an enactment. And uh, Mr. Chairman, for my interest, I'll just jump to uh, section 18, where it said, a department that has legislative approval to retain all or a portion of internal generated funds collected must first lodge the retained internal generated funds in gross into the department's operational bank account designated by the controller and accountant general before disbursements are made. And Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, based on what I said, issuing the GCR makes the money public money, and they needed to have lodged all the money into the consolidated fund before use. This is what I think they have flouted grossly. Honorable Muntaka, does the account set up to um, uh, receive the money, the payments, does it require the approval of the controller and accountant general? Mr. Chairman, that is what this committee is to find out. Because they've admitted they've collected the money. As to where they put it, we all don't know. That is, I think, part of what this committee should find out. How, how have you established that um, GC receipts were used? Mr. Chairman, if you look at the exhibit that we named, the exhibit that we named two, Paragraph four, the last line, just read. Okay, let me just, to make sense, let me read from the second, from the second line. It is therefore difficult to imagine how a government institution seeking to extort money from individuals will insist on issuing official receipts. But, would official receipts here mentioned mean GC receipts? Mr. Chairman, we are talking about government agencies, and government agencies cannot issue any other receipt they call official if it is not GCR. Honorable Muntaka, has any of the participants officially or unofficially petitioned you about any extortion? by the ministry or the organizers before, during, or after the event? Mr. Chairman, we are members of parliament, and we have citizens that put trust in us and f offer to give us information. No, Sometimes, would I be not I being one to know? specific question. Has any of the participants officially... Mr. Chairman, I hope the, my colleague will always let me finish. You can come with a follow-up. I'm ready to answer you. I'm saying that we are members of parliament, and citizens have trust in us. Sometimes they big you with information and they don't want to be known. Sometimes they give information and they tell you that, look, any time you need any further clarification, this is my number, call me. I don't think it is for me to ask because it is beyond doubt. Monies have been collected. I have been able to state with the same ministry's own statement. It is beyond doubt the organization happened. So as to who petitioned me, who raised a concern, it is for the committee. When you invite the, when you invite others, I think you can find out from them. Honorable Mujaka, answer the question. Did somebody petition you about extortions? Yes and no. Mr. Chairman, with a greater respect, confidentiality, confidentiality of people... He was not asking you to name anybody has anybody 
petition you about instructions relating to the event? Yes and no. We are yes, not asking. Yes, you. Chairman. People were not happy about what happened. So they, they complained about instructions? Mr. Chairman, I have not used this word extortion anywhere. And I'll be happy for you to point to me where I have used the word extortion. I've always said they have collected monies. And I think the method and mode was unethical. The question was, has anybody petitioned you about extortions? So you were to answer that question, whether somebody has petitioned you about extortion. Well, nobody, no, nobody has spoken to me about extortions, Ex but people have spoken to me about how unhappy they are about the organization. Honorable Muntaka, I, I again refer you to your ex Exhibit 2, and uh, where you are quoted when you spoke on the floor of Parliament. And uh, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I would quote, this would be the Exhibit 2, the last The documents from the Honorable Muntaka himself. The documents from the and um, the last. We're still watching Midday Live. We'll bring you some more updates on this very story in a subsequent bulletin. Two other stories and Ghana's agreement with the U.S. to host two former Guantanamo Bay detainees ended on January 6. But government is yet to make an express statement on the contentious issue. U.S. Embassy in Ghana has said the future of the two former detainees, Mahmoud Umar Mohammed bin Atef and Khalid Mohammed Salif Aldabi can only be decided by the Ghana government. It is unclear what the position of government is on the matter after the Foreign Affairs Ministry planned press conference was called off on the heels of the presidency addressing the matter. While in opposition, the New Patriotic Party fiercely criticized the John Mahama administration for hosting the two former terror suspects. The two detainees were held in the infamous Guantanamo Bay prison for 14 years over links with terrorist group Al-Qaeda. To another trending story, and three weeks after CV3's expose on the activities of commercial sex workers close to the Kwame Nkrumah interchange, the slum comprising brothels have been demolished by the Accra Metropolitan Assembly. Kwabna Edujinfi was there and has come through with this report. On the 21st of December last year, TV3 aired a news documentary um, revealing the activities of commercial sex workers here at the Kwame Nkrumah Circle along the rail line. And um, for your information, um, that report has gotten some positive feedback from the government. After it was presented to the Minister for Rail Ways, that is um, Joe Gatti. And now what is happening here is that the Accra Metropolitan Assembly, per the request by the um, Railway Ministry, is conducting a demolition exercise right here at where all these activities were taking place. The um, demolition started somewhere around 6.30 a.m. It's a Thursday and um, it's been ongoing for quite some time now as I speak to you now. It's just about um, 9.30 a.m. We will be engaging the um, head of the security force here, that is Superintendent Kwesi Fori, to tell us more about what they have seen so far. When exactly did the exercise start here? Yeah, we started early this morning in line with the AMA's um, tax operations and presently they are doing the demolition at the um, other area here which will be extending to other neighborhoods. But interestingly, they've also informed, you know, those who are in the catchment area regarding the intention of the AMB. So we still count on their support and uh, we'll also be providing the best of security coverage on the ground to enable them you know, spearhead their operations. Okay. Now, usually when such exercises are being conducted, we know um, that these residents here usually resist the activity. Was that the, was the case the same this time around? 
uh, this time around, one, the AMA did a good job by doing a lot of public education. Two, you can see the force level on the ground is very solid uh, to ward off any kind of threat. And thirdly, cooperation from members of the of this area. And um, you might have also noticed that an arsonist tried to disrupt the exercise by setting three separate fires that have been contained by the fire service. And the exercise is ongoing. Okay. Now, for how long will your men be on the ground after today? Oh, as far as the target set by the AMA is completed. We are very supportive and will be by them as, as we move on. Okay. Okay. But then, um, in the course of the exercise, apart from the far issue, what were some of the things that you discovered? I arrested one person also with a small quantity of narcotic, suspected narcotic drugs. Okay. So w what is going to happen to that person? Definitely he will be detained and investigation will commence for it. Thank you very much. So I have been speaking with um, Chief Superintendent Kwesi Fori and he's been telling us more about um, security provision here at the Kwame Nkrumah Circle slum area where um, a demolition is currently ongoing. For TV3, Kwabna Edu Ujemfi, Kwame Nkrumah Circle. So some more also as well on during our subsequent bulletins throughout the day. But let's move straight to the courts where the, the Accra District Court has committed the 14 persons accused of lynching Major Maxwell Mahama. The court presided over by Ebenezer Kwekuansa held that based on the facts presented there is indeed ample evidence to commit them to stand trial at the High Court. And my colleague Salom Amenya has been following the story closely. He joins me via phone. Hello Salom. Good afternoon. Hello Wendy. Now we have some information you've given us but again tell us more on what exactly happened in court today. Well uh, we, we know that the committal process started way back in June and most of the time when things happen, the committal process is actually held to find out whether there is the need for a trial to begin. So that is the process that uh, they have been able to go through successfully. And uh, what, what it means is that this case is now going to move from the central district court to the high court where the, the trial proper is going to uh, begin. And according to the prosecution, uh, they have 15 witnesses that they are going to call before the end of the case. And apart from that, too, they have 63 exhibits, or what you can also call as evidence, that they would uh, be bringing. And this includes cement blocks, a video recording of the action. They also have uh, two uh, single barrel shotguns, seven rounds of ammunition, pictures of the crime scene, metal bar and also the iPhone of the soldier, and then the partly burnt T-shirt. And these are items that they made available to the Accra uh, District High Court. Apart from that, too, uh, 13 people are people that they have seen play a role in the lynching and killing of the soldier because they are in the video. The 14th person is the assemblyman for the area, that is William Barr, who actually uh, is uh, purported to have made a call to these young men or to the youth in the town after the snail seller raised the alarm. So th that is what it is now. Mm. So come the 15th of February, and the trial will, will begin at the high court. Were these 14 accused persons in court? And if you've been able to interact with their lawyer or representative, how did they take the news? Well, uh, before the, 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 the judge actually uh, gave out the, the information that he is committing them or they have been found liable to the count leveled against them. He asked the 14 accused persons if they had anything to say and uh, they were all titled. So after we spoke to their lawyer, Bernard Shaw, uh, to find out if it was uh, their game plan to ensure that nobody speaks until uh, the trial proper uh, actually commences. But according to him, uh, he never told them that it's not a game plan. But they have a right to either speak or not speak. And uh, their moves were not one that you could say was uh, that of uh, maybe 
they were worried to or or they, they were just normal. I, I think that uh, the fact that some of them were released just about uh, a week ago, about 14 of them were discharged, it has given them hope that there's a possibility of uh, probably them not being found guilty because that's what some of them are saying. Thank you so much for the update, Selom Amenya. You're still watching Media Live and the food, that's the Ministry for Food and Agriculture has embarked on 30 million cities to fight. That's earmarked 30 million cities to fight army worm this year. Deputy Sector Minister who made this known said adequate provision has been made ahead of the cropping season. The fall army worm in 2017 destroyed over 20,000 farms, mostly maize. Deputy Minister of Food and Agriculture at the Presidency, Nura Jele, noted the pests are awaiting the raining season when cropping is expected to begin. He, however, says the ministry has made adequate provision this year. And we've even made a provision for what we call strategic stocks. That will be, we are stockpiling the chemicals already waiting. We've budgeted for almost 30 million for army worm control, the 30 million Ghana cities. And we're getting support from other places like the FAO. I know there is also, a, that is a $450,000 uh, grant from the FAO that we are to use to assist in the control of the army worm. But then come the rains, you will see the release of all these monies to buy chemicals and other things already for the control. He added farmers this time round will be sensitized to acquire chemicals solely at the district agriculture directorate. The farmers were in panic. You know, when you hear of an outbreak and this thing, people just panic and then rushing even to queue for the chemical and whatnot. Some felt that, I mean, there was not enough time uh, to get the chemical. Even though the right chemicals were there, they decided making use of other things that they could lay hands on. Some going to the uh, chemical stores just to buy any chemical. But you know, when you go to a chemical store and say, I have army worm on my farm, they will say, try this, try this. So that was not on the recommendation of Minister of Food and Agriculture. Dr. Nura Jele, who received personal protection equipment from the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, noted it will help in the fight against the fall army worm. The FAO representative in Ghana, Abebe Hill Gabriel, said the equipment is intended to equip farmers and other stakeholders before the planting season begins. The contributions that we're making at this time is to support the, the training of trainers, the application of some of the pesticides. We want them to be effective and we want also th them, for them to be safe in terms of public health. And the protective equipment that we have just donated this morning is a contribution on the one hand to, towards that effort. The transboundary based pests last year affected over 25 African countries. And uh, Songuli in the suburb district of the northern region has uh, mentioned that uh, he has appealed to government to include the community in the One Village One Dam program to improve living conditions and also boost agriculture in the area. The dam, which serves seven adjoining communities, dries up annually during the dry season. A dam in the area dug 32 years ago dries from December to May each year, making portable water inaccessible over the period. This water is polluted and unsafe. Spokesperson for the region call on government to urgently intervene. The One Village One Dam policy is one of the Kufuado administration's flagship programs aimed at ensuring all year round agriculture in the three regions of the north through the construction of irrigation dams.
To some of the stories in the Asante Achim Algo Traditional Council in the Ashanti region has warned against the lease of land to nomadic headsmen at Agogo. Uh, special mounts on them to evict them from the area. The Queen Mother of Agogo says that the traditional authority backs the youth to fight what it describes as lawlessness, cruelty and impunity of the nomads. Here's a report by Benjamin Edo. The Ashanti Regional Security Council on Wednesday held a meeting with stakeholders at Agogo in the Ashanti Achim North District to resolve the perennial destruction of farmland by cattle and other nefarious activities by alien herdsmen in the area. On Monday, three soldiers and a police officer were wounded in a shooting incident between the herdsmen and a task force set up to evict the nomadic herdsmen from the town. Residents say they feel neglected by successive governments. They claimed more than 40 people have been killed by the headsmen, adding the government has not shown enough commitment towards ending the menace. But the Regional Security Council has beefed up the Joint Military Police Task Force to prevent matters from getting out of control. The Member of Parliament for Santia Chim North, Andi Apia, has appealed to government to implement a 2012 court ruling on the case. The next one is, I have to say, 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 the Fulani herdsmen have not been given any lands here by the chiefs. We are calling on the authorities to act swiftly without fear or favor. Queen Mother of Agogo, Nana Draben Afrakuma Kisi Abuodum, says the traditional authority is concerned about the plight of residents. <laughs> The Fulani headsmen should leave. I'm appealing to authorities to help end this menace once and for all. The Ashanti Regional Minister, Simon Ose Mensa, promised the court's decision on the issue will be implemented. We are going to look at the previous roadmap that my predecessors uh, set up. And then we review the whole roadmap and ensure that. Uh, those we think we cannot work with, we change them and add those we think are implementable and ensure that we resolve this problem once and for all. He noted the atrocities were becoming too many and will not tolerate any impunity. We make sure that the task force is going to do their work within the law. Uh, any resistance, uh, they should let us know. I don't think we are going to tolerate any impunity henceforth. Fulani headsmen who hitherto settled in the northern part of Ghana found their way to Agogo about a decade ago. In January 2012, the Kumasi High Court ordered the Regional Security Council to take immediate, decisive, efficacious and efficient action to flush out all cattle from Abroapong, Mankaila, Nyamibetre, Koreso, Adomimu, Beboso and Brahabebome all in the Agogo traditional area, the only exception being cattle that have been properly confined in a permitted area. Right from our story, President Ekufad has sworn in Ghana's High Commissioner to Malaysia, Ikwa Sechua Ahinkra, charging her to ensure Ghana taps into the expertise of Malaysia's oil palm industry. The newly appointed Malaysian High Commissioner, Ikea Situa Ahinkra, worked with the President when he was a Foreign Affairs Minister during the John Kufu administration. President Ikufado said Malaysia and Ghana attained independence in the same year, in 1957. However, Malaysia has taken giant economic steps, particularly in the oil palm sector. The President urged the High Commissioner to work hard to ensure Ghana taps the expertise of Malaysia in the palm oil industry. They are still struggling with a few tons of palm oil and they are producing the greatest amount in the world and are deriving huge benefits from it. There's a great deal that we can derive from our relations with them. You're going to be at the cutting edge of developing those relations and intensifying the economic exchanges between Malaysia and Ghana. The newly appointed High Commissioner pledged to work to improve trade relations between the two countries. 
Your Excellency, I am aware also of your my responsibility to drive private sector investment into Ghana to help in achieving the government's flagship programs of the one district, one factory, the one village, one dam, planting for food and jobs, and the overall objective of developing Ghana beyond aid. Now to healthcare and education as well. And um, we're talking about the registrar of the Ghana Nursing and Ministry Council, Felix Nyante, who has announced the inclusion of a sign language in French into the curricula of the nursing institutions, welcoming some health practitioners from Sierra Leone who are in the country to pursue diploma in nursing and midwifery. The registrar said the changes in the curricula is to prioritize issues of persons with hearing impairment. 50 health workers comprising general nurses and midwives at about 8.30 Wednesday evening arrived in the country to pursue a two-year diploma course in their fields of endeavor. The initiative is as a result of the collaboration between the Sierra Leone Ministry of Health and the Nursing and Midwifery Council of Ghana under the auspices of the Ministry of Health. The Sierra Leone health workers chose to upgrade their intellect and professional skills in Ghana because of the existing peace and standard of healthcare delivery in the country. Those who will undertake the midwifery course would be stationed at Kolbu, while the general nursing practitioners will be posted to Kofuridia. We have done all the accreditation issues and it is interesting to know that the University of Cape Coast has also granted affiliation status to this program because they would award the academic diplomas at the end of the two years. Registrar at the Nursing and Midwifery Council, Felix Nyante, said the council has effected changes in the curricula of all nursing training institutions in the country with the view of improving patient health worker relations. He is optimistic more African countries will collaborate with Ghana to build the capacities of health workers to address dire health concerns on the continent. You're still watching Media Life, don't go away. And when you see that it's obviously time for business, the Ghana Revenue Authority will from Friday, January 12, 2018, charge an African Union import levy of 0.2% on the cost issuance and freight of goods. This takes effect after the African Union Assembly decided to impose a 0.2% levy in September 2017 on eligible imports of goods originating from a non-member territory into member states' territory to be consumed in the member states under the African Levy Act passed by Parliament of Ghana. Imports which qualify under the Act shall attract a 0.2% levy. And joining me this afternoon in the studio is Executive Secretary of the Importers and Exporters Association, Samson Asaki Awingobet. Good afternoon and thanks for your time. Good afternoon and then a happy new year. A happy new year to you too. Happy new year to all the viewers as well. Right. Now, what, what exactly do you make of this levy? Well, uh, quite clearly, I'm sure at the time in 2017 when His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana, uh, when head of states met on AU and they came out with uh, how they will get resources from AU African countries, itself membership <coughs> countries, to be able to finance uh, AU activities without falling to uh, 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 donor countries to support them. And so there was a decision that there is a need for them to come up with a, a percentage on import that's come from non-African con uh, African countries or, or AU countries. And so when we talk of, when we talk of third world countries, what uh, we are talking about China, we are talking of uh, Italy, Germany, USA, European Union, wherever, it's not, they are not a member state to the African Union. And so all import that will be coming outside EU state, will, they will, it, there's this 0.2% percent percentage that will be attracted. And so it's going to be a fee that if you are importing outside these EU countries, 
So if you're imported from Nigeria to Ghana, I'm sorry, you're not going to pay. If you're imported from Togo to Ghana, you're not going to pay. If you're imported from Liberia to Ghana, you're not going to pay. But if you're imported from those countries that have, have earlier made submission, meaning a 0.2% will be attracted or will be added to the duties that you've been paying. Knowing so that you've been calling for in some instances even a total scrap of some of these levies yes quite How clearly disturbing is yes, this for yes you? quite clearly ghana is a, is a member state to eu and that one we cannot uh, so eu also contribute to our peace stability in the sub in sahara or sub region but the point is that since our head of state or since the president went for this meeting and came back we think that there was it, it, it should be prudent enough for the whole government machine to say okay let us meet the stakeholders because yes this government this is eu decision but in, back in various countries, they have various civil societies that are very responsible or that are responsible to these groups that at the end of the day, they will be taking money from them. So to even sit with us, like the president returning from AU uh, conferences, to meet with important export association, with Guta, with AGR, with Gift and others, to tell us that this year, 2017, September, when we went for AU summit, this was what was agreed. And we know that you are the front runners. You know that you are the, the chief's whips of, of these groups. So we want to discuss and even uh, also seek your input about it. Of course, probably we would have said, okay, the timing of itself, the implementation, look at, because if they had discussed with us, we would have said that. Coming back from Christmas, and I'm sure today is on the 10th, my, uh, was it on the 10th, right? Yes. Today is 11th. Today is 11th, right. So, and, and on, the, on the 12th, you know what business community or every Ghanaian goes through in, during, after, after, but, but after Christmas. But did you in any way? Now, we have not been consulted in any way. We all heard it in the news when the president said, made the announcement upon return from AU summit. But did and you also said, try reaching out, uh, stakeholders, reaching out to the president or the ministry involved with some of these activities? Oh, but quite clearly, the ministry knows that they have a key stakeholder. No, you we haven't answered my question. Yeah, did yeah, you yeah. at least try doing that? We, we will not because it's government, it's policy that government is formulating. And so any time government is coming out with a policy of, the, of this nature, it is embedded that it, they have to meet us or they have to invite us. And when they invite us, we refuse to go. So it means that if they, hadn't, it's if they, do, if they don't do anything about it, you won't do anything about it? Is that no, the case? I'm, because it all lies on your laps. And I'm, if you, nothing is done about it, you air your concerns as well. I'm sure you heard me when the announcement was made. I made a statement. And one will tell you that it is prudent enough for the Minister of Finance or the Foreign Affairs Ministry, or the Minister of Trade to have invited us for discussion. Indeed, we cannot be running to government corridors all the time, but government also ought to know that I, I'm going to make this money. There's a reason. Indeed, if you government had met us, we can also put any time there's AU conferences. Don't they talk about uh, uh, bilateral trade, international and multinational trade issues, policies? Can, like, would, would, we, would, we, would, we may also propose that, okay, what's important should we pay for the country to get the money? It, portion of contribution to AU, anytime there's AU conferences, there's, there should be a need for them to extend an invitation to us so that we will be all, also go and listen to them and, and see what are some of the, the policies and, and, and then, and then uh, uh, and policy directives that AU is talking about in terms of international trade and bilateral trade. So what next it, for you what will as be importers our and exporters? Well, what is next for us is that uh, we, have, we are just to, I'm sure you, you also saw it in the news yesterday that uh, on the 12th, which is tomorrow, uh, they will be implementing it. Indeed, the year has just begun. You saw that tax stamp was implemented. Uh, so many things in, in the pipeline that government wants to bring. We as civil society and responsible society will be speaking, will be raising the issue, including, I'm sure, speaking to your network alone, the government is listening. And I'm sure uh, it is better late than never. Uh, quite clearly, I'm sure. Probably, if someone is speaking to the president, if someone is very close to the president, if someone is very close to the minister of finance, would we'll say that the important is we are not going to kick against it okay. entirely. But we think that they ought to have met with us. Indeed, we we'll have also told them, okay, don't, yes, we, we may agree for it to implement, but the timing is not prudent. After January, after first uh, New Year, 12 on the 12th, not even February, not even March. Okay. Not even first quarter or second quarter, then bam, you brought it in. Thank so you so much. The um, height of importers should be concerned by government. Asaki Wingobet, he is the executive secretary for Imports and Exporters. We're grateful for your time, I'm Samson. Grateful, grateful for You're being still with watching you too. Midday Live. Two, some more stories away from business. The two police officers who have been shot dead by a known gunman at Droboso in the Shanti region this morning. One other officer is currently receiving treatment at the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital after sustaining gunshot wounds. Our reporter, Ibrahim Abubakar, has been speaking to the Ashanti Regional Police PRO on this development.
Can you confirm to us the killing of two police officers at Drobonso this morning? Yeah, I confirm the shooting of two police officers and injury to one police officer this morning at about 5.30 a.m. at Drobonso, which is near Kumewu here in the Ashanti region. So what information have you picked so far? Well, so far we've gathered that uh, these were personnel who had closed from their night patrols on their way back to their various offices from Tent City when this unfortunate incident happened. They actually uh, had laid ambush that with uh, those guys that shot or the armed men, eight of them, that had shot into the police car, instantly killing um, two and then injuring one. As I speak to you, we have um, bodies of the deceased at Confanocho uh, Teaching Hospital Morgue, and then we have the uh, injured person on admission being attended to at the hospital. Now, what is the current state of the injured person? Uh, let me just say that uh, my command makes me understand that he is responding to treatment. Have you so far been able to make any arrests? We haven't, but uh, Right when we got the information, we initiated investigations. And so the information that I have given to you now is preliminary investigations that uh, we've gathered. Uh, there are further investigations that, that's ongoing to get these perpetrators to book or these supposed armed men that had shot into the uh, police vehicle this morning that was returning from Drobonso on a tent city um, assignment. Well, thank you very much. I've been engaging with the public relations officer of the um, Ashanti Regional Police Command here in Kumasi, ASP Juliana Obin. My name is Ibrahim Abubakar, TV3 Kumasi. And here in the Greater Accra region, I am Wendy Lai. You're still watching Media Live. We are Sports Next. Do stay. Good afternoon. Welcome back to Midday Live here on TV3. My name is Anako Jafre with a sports update for you. Let's get into the details. And contrary to reports circulated in the media that Vice Chairman of the Black Stars Management Committee, Wilfred Osel Palmer, has been banned from speaking to the media following his comment about Ghana's failure to qualify for the 2018 World Cup. TV3 Sports can confirm he has rather been informed in an official letter from the GFA to tender an apology. Thierry Nyan brings us a summary of the findings by the Ethics Committee. Some background to the story is that uh, Wilfred Osei Palmer, uh, he is the vice chairman of the Black Stars Management Committee, had made certain comments on radio, um, you know, that a failure to make the 2018 World Cup by the Black Stars was due to the fact that a GFA or the Ministry of Youth and Sports failed to, you know, make, uh, you know, some um, unclassified payments to match officials. That was to smoothing, uh, you know, whatever deal it was or our progress to the World Cup. This was deemed inappropriate by the Ethics Committee of the Ghana Football Association. He was invited. An investigation was uh, made into the matter. And the findings, uh, some of them have been the fact that um, they, they say that, uh, you know, according to documents that was released, that Wilfred Osei Palmer's uh, comments were inappropriate, that he should have taken cognizance uh, you know, of his esteemed positions at the, uh, you know, Ghana Football Association, you know, to refrain from some of these uh, topics and statements. Now, the decision uh, that was made by the Ethics Committee says that um, Wilfred Osei Palmer should make sure that none of these uh, errors or mistakes are repeated uh, in the future. And also, and most importantly, he should attend a written apology to the Ghana Football Association's Executive Committee. He should also tend another apology letter to the Ghana Football Association and also to the Honorable Minister of Youth and Sports, um, Isaac A. Siama. So, these were the findings. Actually, nothing uh, in the document, uh, you know, points to the fact that he has been banned from speaking, uh, you know, about the Ghana Football Association or the Black Stars uh, in the media going forward.
so my colleague there, Thierry Nyan, explain issues relating to the decision by the Ghana Football Association Ethics Committee demanding an apology from the Vice President of the Black Stars Management Committee, Wilfred Osei Pama, for comment he made in relation to um, payment of some monies to referees and all of that. But let's go on. And the Confederation of African Football says it will now pay the indemnities and benefits of all referees appointed for international matches in a bid to stem corruption. The CAF Executive Committee decided at a meeting in Morocco that host federations will no longer be required to pay for flights and accommodation of referees as was the practice in the past. And the Ghana Football Association has outlined plans to synchronize the Ghana Premier League calendar with a start date of February 11, but could seriously put um, to the test with a number of legal cases threatening the start of the league. Here is, here is sports journalist Sadek Adams on the court cases that could derail the proposed date of the Ghana Premier League. The Ghana Football Association announced its date to start the 2017-18 Ghana Premier League season on Saturday, February 11, 2018. Many clubs have started their pre-season training while others are participating in the ongoing Galka GA tournament in Cape Coast and Kovasi. With Tachiman City President Charles Kojoin team set for a protest at the Court of Arbitration for Sports after the GFA legal system threw away their case against the 2017 champions of the National Division 1 zone and newly promoted GPL club 11 Wonders over alleged use of an unqualified player during a derby match. Meanwhile, the general manager of newly promoted 11 Wonders, Techi Ahin, has also threatened to sabotage the commencement of the 2017-18 Ghana Premier League season should Techi Man City win its appeal at CAS in their protest to remove Wonders and be handed a Premier League sport instead. But sports journalist Adek Adams says the issues surrounding the league are huge and believes they will go a long way to affect the tentative date slated for the start of the league. And the fact is that there is a case at cast. The FA failed to, I mean, uh, tender in whatever was supposed to be done. And so CAF will rule. And when their ruling comes down, it is binding on the association. I don't know when the case will be called, but it will be very difficult for the FA to follow the calendar. And for that 11th uh, February commencement date of the league, I don't think it's, it, the league will uh, I mean, come on a schedule. But the main problem has got to do with judicial issues with Great Olympics, with the Chiman City, and uh, a couple of them in the lower divisions. It will be very difficult for the league to commence on the 11th of February. On to some transfer news now in DR Congo's Cedric Bakambu is now Africa's most expensive player. He attained the status after completing a move from Spanish side Villarreal to Chinese side Beijing Guan. The striker has already undergone his medical after the £65 million deal and is said to be unveiled in the Chinese capital later this week. Bakambu turned down several chances to play in the English Premier League to sign um, to sign his £16 million a year contract in China. The forward joined the La Liga side back in 2015 on a five-year contract and has scored 48 goals for the Spaniards in 105 matches. And now let's go on to our next story. And a delegation from the Confederation of African Football, CAF and Roland um, Beja auditing firm are expected in Cameroon tomorrow to assess Cameroon's preparations to host the 2019 Africa Cup of Nations. Ahead of the inspection to a former midfielder, Jeremy Njitab says he is confident that his country is ready for Africa's um, showpiece event. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I will take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, CAF, uh, the president of the CAF and the committee of executive to giving us another opportunity to play another uh, to another sector of the game which is uh, uh, legend or ambassador uh, because in the past we didn't have this kind of opportunity today now you could see when you talk about football you cannot uh, put a footballer on the side it's uh, important to to put footballer or former footballer at front 
I think this is a good uh, idea for the new uh, committee. Jeremy, quick one. Um, another inspection team will be in Cameroon to assess Cameroon's readiness for AFCON 2019. Are you sure Cameroon will be ready for AFCON 2019? Sure, of course. Uh, we, we, our, we, if uh, you follow the news, our president, the president of the Republic, again, uh, the, the, on his uh, last speech of the year, he reminded again that he, take the, he took the engagement, the engagement to organize that competition. So we are we're going to organize that competition. That's all the sports here on Midday Live. My name is Anako Jaffrey. Thanks very much for watching. Always a pleasure serving you. International News is up next. Stay with us. Like I've already mentioned, let's go for international news now. More than 300 people have been arrested in Tunisia overnight as anger over the government's austerity measures spilled into the streets once more. Police used tear gas against large crowds, demonstrating against price rises affecting basic goods. The army was deployed into towns across the country to protect government buildings, which have become targets. Protests have taken place in at least 10 different areas, including the capital, Tunis, in the last few days. The protests began peacefully last week, but escalated on Monday evening. Wednesday was the third successive night of violence, with almost 600 people arrested in total since the start of the week. The demonstrators are demanding the government dropped the 2018 budget, which opposition groups describe as unfair. They also want to see more welfare payments for struggling families. Next, we have entertainment. Brought to you by... And film producer and actress and writer Kafri Danku has decided to make public the dark part of her life in order to shape the lives, hopes and aspirations of many other young women in a 120-page book entitled Silence is Not Golden. Kafri Danku reflects on how she overcame bitter experiences and is hopeful the book would help mold the social life of Guinean women. Eva Tipuka has the rest of the story. So we'll bring you some more on that very story in our subsequent bulletins. You're still watching Midday Live, but I'm told the story is ready now, so let's go for it. Kafui Danku rocked social media with a lonely and ill-feeling picture in December 2017. There are times when there are so many questions on your mind and it feels like you want to go crazy. The, you know, I went through quite a phase. I suffered in silence. So after some few um, eye-opening encounters and knowledge, I've decided to write a book, a book called Silence is Not Golden. Years of lifetime experiences packaged in a book form. A lot of other women were going through the same phase that I was going through due to emotions that were suppressed. It mounts a lot of pressure on people, but then very few people are able to notice a whole year of time and resources. It's about managing silence and stress. So whoever thinks that, oh, this book, I, I need the remedies. Maybe I'm suffering in silence. I'm depressed. I'm worried. I'm troubled. I've been, I've been disappointed. If you want a remedy or if you want uh, some solutions, definitely you would like to read Silence is Not Golden, especially if you're su suffering in silence. That is impressive. But how does she reach out to those who cannot read? We think we're having an audio book in a local language, maybe translating everything that's in Silence is Golden into Chui or 
uh, the, yeah, into Chui would be okay. That was the pre-launch of the book, Silence is Not Golden. Major launch of the book will be in February. And that will be all for this afternoon. My name is Wendy Lai. You have a blessed afternoon. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Thanks for watching.